quoting the word of God and I believe that there is a spirit in this atmosphere that's going to do a work because our children have been quoting the word of God these past couple days these classrooms every part of this church has been filled with people quoting scripture and I believe there's an overflow that's in this place because of it I believe it I believe it so strong hallelujah Jesus oh Search the world, God. It couldn't fill me. Sing it with us. I search the world. It couldn't fill me. It couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures of fate are never enough. I like this. But then you came along. You came along. Every desire. 
in this room today every life can be restored every sickness can be healed every person can be delivered every soul can be filled when God is in the room hallelujah we say it often but it is so true where God is anything is possible it just takes a little bit of faith. Our prayer team is going to come. They're going to make their way to the front. If you have any need, by stepping to come to the front is a show of faith that, God, I'm going to trust in you for these situations. We're going to pray together. Some names will be on the screen. We're going to pray in the name of Jesus. And I know God is willing and ready to do something at the sanctuary this morning. Whatever you have need of, pray together, won't you? Lord, we bring our needs to you because you're here. You said we can boldly approach your throne, Jesus. We don't come and concede or, or that we have the right to, but we come in humility, but in confidence, knowing that you're our God and that you hear and you answer prayer. Each one of these needs, Lord, people need comfort. People need healing. They need direction. They need strength. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch. Each one that's making their way to one of our prayer teams as the word proclaims to be anointed with oil and prayed over. I pray that you would heal, deliver, set free. Whatever the circumstances in this place, Lord, you're in this place. Hallelujah. We trust in you. We believe in you, Jesus. We bring our needs to you. We bring our needs to you. Hallelujah. Can you just thank him now for hearing and answering? You're in this room. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We
wanting to speak to somebody right now. He's wanting some chains to break right now in this place. Every fear will bow in this place. At the name of Jesus, why don't we lift our hands all over this place? As we sing this right here, sing chains fall. would be you're singing a song that Jesus could change everything and the question would be then but you don't know my circumstance that he needs to change you're right but I do know him and I promise you Jesus can change everything there's not a mountain too tall there's not a river too wide there's not a sickness there's not a sin too glory to God he can change everything in a moment my God can break through your situation he can turn your life around hallelujah 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 praise God praise God and that's the God we serve at the sanctuary I introduce you to Jesus He's a soul saver, a heart fixer, a mind regulator. He makes a way out of no way. He turns your situation around. Somebody testify, has he ever been good to you in this place? Glory to God. There were people who had cancer. They don't have cancer anymore. There are people who had backaches. They don't have backaches anymore. There were people way down in sin. Jesus rescued them. They don't have sin anymore. I'm telling you, we serve a great God. We serve a great God in this place. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And we're so glad you're at the sanctuary. If you're our guest sanctuary family, can you make them welcome? So glad you are here. 
As you make your way back to your seats, shake a couple hands, make sure everybody has a warm welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. We are so blessed that you are here. Glory to God. Praise God, praise God. I was thinking this morning in 2020, we were sick of a lot of stuff. But one of the things we were sick of was hearing the word unprecedented. This is unprecedented, and this is unprecedented, and this is unprecedented, and this is, well, I'm happy to use it 2024 because God is doing unprecedented things in the sanctuary. And I'm happy to use that word here today. As they mentioned, Junior Bible Quizzing had their extravaganza. I was suffering in the Florida sun, so I missed it. But I got great reports. Sister Megan favorite, she brought a friend from Panera here on Friday night. And that young lady received the gift of the Holy Ghost here at Junior Bible Quiz and Extravaganza. We celebrate that. We also celebrate Jay Gervich, Jacob, and Joseph Marcatoni receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost here at Junior Bible Quizzing on Friday night. Jacob and Joseph, this dynamic duo, these brothers got baptized on the same time. at the same time. They got the Holy Ghost on the same time. And they were the undefeated team at the same time at Junior Bible Quizzing Extravaganza. They said there was a 30-point question, and it came down to the wire. And they said in Acts 2, quote, Acts 2, verse 3, which one hit the buzzer? He hit the buzzer. He said, 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he won the tournament, and more importantly, he got the promise, for the promise is to you and to your children, to everybody. It's the promise of the Holy Ghost. Praise God, praise God. Speaking of junior extravaganza, we'll do a more formal thing, but I can't help myself on some of this. The O'Neill boys placed fifth. We thank God for that out of all of them that were here. Benjamin Overmeyer and Jacob Marcatoni were recognized as two of the highest scoring quizzers here at that tournament. Amen. It's fun to win. It's fun to get the trophies. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, they are hiding God's word in their heart. What a powerful thing that is for them and for this church at large. Senior Bible Quiz Extravaganza is happening this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we get more of the word of God saturated in the atmosphere here. We thank God for his word. I want to remind you that our Save Our Children offering is due this week. If you can turn any of your pledges in so that we can give to this great uh, this great fund. And if you'll turn your attention to the screen for the rest of our announcements today. Hey, Sanctuary family. I just want to take a moment to update you on all the exciting things we've got going on over the next few weeks. Join us this Wednesday night as Pastor continues his series, As Unto the Lord, A Study of Biblical Holiness. It's been a great series so far. It's richly blessed my life, and I know it's going to bless yours. This coming Sunday, we're going to be joined by a special singing group from Indiana Bible College. Make sure that you're here. It's going to be a great move of God. They're going to lead us into an awesome time of worship, and we expect God to do great things. Trivia night. Everybody say trivia night. Friday. Sanctuary kids. There's going to be a trivia night. You can get a table with your friends and family. The theme is going to be game night. You can decorate your table, dress up as your favorite characters from your favorite board game, card game, video game. You can bring your own food for the table and participate in the silent auction, 50-50 raffle, and concessions. They're also going to be selling mulligans for each table. You can find out more at the Church Center app. Speaking of the Church Center app, if you haven't downloaded the app now, what are you doing? Get out your phone and download the app. You can connect with the church by signing up for a small group, a team, or register for upcoming events like the Trivia Night. It's a great way to stay up to date with everything that's happening here at the sanctuary. We want to say thank you to everyone who gives faithfully to the work that God is doing here through the sanctuary. If you wish to give, you can do so in one of three ways, by using the Church Center app or online at 
come, or you can give in person by dropping your tithes or offering in one of the standing baskets as you leave the auditorium. We've already said it, but we want to say it one more time. If you're new here, we are honored. Today. Please join us in the connection. We interrupt these uh, commercials here <laughs> with some technical difficulties. We have no idea, but please fix that by next week, whatever that is. My heart can't sustain. Choir, try your best. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Let's usher back into the presence of God. God bless our great choir.
greater, that he's greater than any sickness, any situation, any sin, anything that comes against you, he is greater. Oh, he is greater. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love, absolutely love watching our musicians and our singers sing unto the Lord and worship him with their expressions. You can tell that the passion is there. So for the next 20 seconds, let's give our passion to the Lord and tell him, Lord, I am here. I am worshiping you because of who you are. Lord, you are greater than anything that I'm facing today. Lord, you are greater than anything that happened this week or that comes before me, Lord. And as long as I submit to you, Lord, I am worshiping you to say that you are above all, Jesus. You are above all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I ask that you help me today to deliver the word that you gave me. And I bind every distraction that might try to come through the sound system, that might come through our mind or anywhere else in the name of Jesus. Lord, and let your word go forth without anybody standing in the way. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You guys may be seated. Thank you. I get the opportunity to speak to you twice in a week. Thankful for that. I love my church family. I love y'all. <clears throat> Pastor's going to come back next week and set me straight, I promise. <laughs> no, but we're going to start in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 6, and verse 8 as well. I'm going to read from the NLT version today a little bit in some King James. But I'm so thankful. I'll say this while, they're, while you're getting your Bibles out and you're pulling that up. So thankful for our Bible quizzers. Sister Veronica said there's like a lingering and overflow that is in this building from that word being quoted today. And I feel it so strong. So thank you to the Saucers and the Fergies for leading that program, teaching our young people how to quote the word. And then we get to benefit from it today as well. So thankful for that. So thankful. In verse chap in uh, chapter six, verse number five, it says, "The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and He saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. He was sorry He had ever made them and put them on the earth, and it broke His heart." But we skip to verse eight, and it says, "But Noah found favor with the Lord." And then even if we skip to ver chapter 1, verse 7, I know I'm skipping ahead, but if you could put that up there for me. And when everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, go into the boat with all of your family, for among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. Noah, get into the boat. And that's what I'm going to speak to us today about Noah getting into the boat, giving you an invitation to get into the boat as well. We read our first pieces of scripture in Genesis chapter 6, and we see that God loved his people so much, but their actions broke his heart and drove him to wipe away the earth, their existence. Pain and sorrow will do that to us sometimes, drive us to ultimatums and absolute decisions. And I can imagine God was looking down on creation and seeing all the evil, wicked things, and that it pained him. And as he skimmed the world, Noah caught God's eye. Noah was a righteous man, one who lived blameless and one who walked with the Lord. Then there was this moment as God smiled down and he said, oh yes, there's Noah. And maybe God felt a bit of relief as he observed and found Noah and remembered him. Because in verse eight, it says, Noah found favor with the Lord. So God begins to reveal his plan to Noah. He intends to wipe the earth of the wickedness and tell Noah to build a boat. And he gives him the measurements of the boat in that same passage of scripture. And at this point of the story, Noah probably had never seen a boat this size and probably questioned if it would even float. I mean, this thing was huge if you read their measurements. And God didn't even tell him anything of how it was gonna happen. He said, build a boat. I'm wiping away creation. Noah, build a boat. 
I'm sure if I was Noah, I would be asking all of the questions. I'm a very inquisitive person. But I'd be like, why a boat? What are, what's a boat going to do? This big old thing, what's it going to do? How is that really going to help God? It hasn't been to re revealed to Noah just exactly how God was going to wipe away the earth. The only thing Noah knew was build a structure with absolutely like really no true plan of how it was going to work out or how it would unfold. After that, God gives Noah the dimensions, the instructions of building the boat. He reveals another piece of the plan. I'm going to cover the earth with a flood, and you and your family will enter the boat. Again, if I was Noah, I would ask, okay, what in the world is a flood? You want me to build this big structure. You're going to bring a flood. You're going to wipe away all of this. Can you please give me the definition of what rain is? I'm not pulling it up in my personal dictionary, Lord, because some scholars say that it had never rained before this time. So there was so much unknown for Noah. And all he had was this blueprint, these measurements that God said, build a boat. He had the question of, okay, this is the blueprint. I don't know exactly what to do with it, but I'm going to do it. What's rain? And how in the world is this big structure going to save my family from destruction? How does this work? But God said, build a boat. Noah did just that. He began to build a boat, something he didn't understand, but he obeyed. And Noah began to build the boat according to the dimensions that the Lord instructed. And as I researched it, I think it took about 70 years for Noah to build this ark. 70 years of people thinking he was crazy. 70 years of probably being the end of every joke at all the local gatherings, house parties, festivals that happened. And maybe even 70 years of wondering if he really heard the voice of God. Nail after nail and board after board, Noah built the boat in uncertainty and chaos all around him, but with faith in God's word. In chapter 7, verse 1, we just read it. It said, when everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, go into the boat with all of your family among all the people of the earth. I can see that you alone are righteous. Everything is done. The boat is built. And the Lord says, get in the boat, Noah. Now the real test of the faith comes. It was okay when he was building it because he was able to sleep in his own bed. He was able to be on familiar ground. Nothing really changed when he was building something out of wood and he was able to still return to what was familiar to him. It was fine when he still had the opportunity to go about his own life and do whatever he wanted and then just add it in maybe building the boat. It was fine when Noah steered the decisions of his own life and his family, but now he has to make a decision to get into the boat. When I read Noah's story, I don't read any details at all of how Noah built or configured any steering mechanisms. The boat didn't have a sail, didn't have any oars, didn't even have a rudder to steal, steer, no power and no steering. It was like a car without a steering wheel. How does that really work? Noah just was instructed to get into the boat. He had to make up in his mind to get into the boat and allow God to steer his life. He had to make up in his mind that he would release control and completely entrust God in every step of that decision. With a giant leap of faith, Noah and his family got into the boat along with the additional animals God had instructed him to take with them. Then the floodwaters came, 40 days and 40 nights. And then scripture shows that they kind of floated a little bit over a year. I think it's like 371 days of being in a boat, not being able to control where it was going and completely trusting that God was steering the boat for them. Can you imagine what Noah was feeling during that time? Wow, God kept his word. He provided a way out for me and my family. I'm thankful I listened to the voice of God. The boat saved Noah and his family from death. This unknown structure that he had no idea why God told him to do it saved Noah. It was his salvation. The ark was Noah's salvation, but Noah had to choose to get into the boat. Noah had to choose the one thing that would save him from destruction. Noah had to choose salvation. 
And in the midst of the world's craziness and judgment coming, God provided a way out. God provided the answer. God provided salvation with a boat. God's love for people, man, it wins every time, right? He provided a way out for Noah because he loved Noah. He had favor on Noah. His love for the people always won. In fact, he always created a way out and a plan and a salvation for them, for us. They just needed to see it and choose it. Just like he provided a way out for Noah, he's provided a way out for us too. He chose us over and over again. Provided salvation for each of us. He chose us in the Garden of Eden. After sin entered the world, he had a plan already in place to redeem us. He loves us that much. He chose us when he died on the cross for our sin so that we could be saved and have a relationship with us. He always provided a way out of our sins no matter what. His faithful love never ends. His mercies are new every morning, no matter what happens every morning. But we have to act on it. Just like Noah, we have to choose to get into the boat. We have to decide to allow God to steer and guide our lives. I often wonder if the Lord looks down on the world today and has the same thoughts from Genesis chapter 6 toward the sin that runs freely among us. Does he look down and see all the junk and the ugly and it grieves him? Does he look down and see all the things that we maybe dabble in, not really knowing, and say, oh dear, my sweet child, I've provided a way out for you. Don't you see? You just have to get into the boat. Does he hear our prayers of us begging for a change? And he is shouting from the heavens saying, my child, I provided a way out for you. Get in the boat. God asked me to come here today to offer you an invitation to get in the boat to the person who has tried it their way and it seems like it's you're in the same spot with no change or relief, God is calling you to get into the boat. If this is your first service ever hearing about the way out of your sins, so let me tell you about my God. Pastor already did it today, but I'm gonna tell you again. He provided a way for you to get into the boat and have everlasting life. God came down from heaven to save us from our sins. And in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn us, but that the, that the world through him might be saved. And then in Acts 4, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the way, the path, and the salvation for our sins. He came down from heaven, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross so that we might be saved. He provided a way of salvation for us, an ark or a boat, if you will, a pathway to everlasting life. When people hear this, some of them ask them, well, okay, I believe that God came down and did all this. Well, what do I do? How do I act on this? Well, guess what? Peter had the same question asked to him when the church was formed in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the same verse that was quoted by our Bible quizzers all day yesterday, Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then in verse 41, then they gladly received this word and were baptized. And in the same day were added unto them 3,000 souls. They heard this word that was in Acts chapter 2 and acted on it. They followed this scripture. The salvation of my God was provided. That's the salvation he's provided for us all. God provided salvation for Noah with a boat, and God provided salvation through him, through Jesus for us. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, Sanitha, I already have the Holy Ghost. I'm good. What's this got to do with me? My question back to you is, have you truly gotten in the boat and surrendered your will, your plans, and your decisions for your life 
and allow God to completely steer the boat. Noah said yes to uh, to salvation, but he had to get in the boat and completely surrender every action and expectation. He said yes to the salvation that God planned, and you've said yes to the salvation that God has planned too by getting the Holy Ghost, but you still have to get in the boat. When he and his family stepped onto that boat, they let it all go and said, Lord, I'm trusting you with this unknown. I'm trusting you in this storm. I'm trusting you to steer and guide our lives. We no longer have control. You do. When you get in the boat, you let go entirely and trust the Lord to steer through every crazy tumultuous hailstorm, whatever that storm is, you are trusting the Lord to guide you. And I understand that that's a huge ask to let go of control. I know I have that issue, but the Lord is asking all of us to let go of control and give it to him. I know where some of you are at. See, I wanted things for my own too. I wanted to stay on the ramp of the boat and see the boat. It's right there. I wanted to see it. I even kind of wanted to touch it, make sure that it was there. But I really didn't fully want to get in the boat because of the things I wanted for my life, that I had plans for my life. See, in my career, I wanted to be a CFO of a Fortune 500 company or maybe the local hospital where I worked at. I loved the business and corporate world and felt like I was decent at it. I had plans of my own, dreams and successes of my own in my own terms. I wanted it my way. And God got a hold of me on a missions trip and essentially asked me to get in the boat, sacrifice my plans, my dreams, and pick up his. I had to make a choice. I had to choose Jesus and I had to get in the boat. I had to come to an altar, put my will on it, sacrifice it, die out to my will, and pick up his will for my life. And I did all of that, and I let him steer the boat. Some days, I had to go to an altar or make my own altar and do it more than once a day. (laughs) I'm a pretty stubborn person, but I had to make a choice every day to say, you know what, Lord? It's your will over mine. I tried to do it my will, my way, and it never really worked out. It always ends in stressful situations, frustrations, probably making more enemies than friends, and it sent me on a perpetual spiral of darkness when I tried to make my own decisions without consulting God or allowing him to direct me. I had to come up to an altar and tell him, okay, God, here are my ideas, desires, and actions. They aren't honorable, and my expectations don't match up. I lay them on the altar, and I'm picking up your will for my life. I'm picking up your word and following it, and I am getting in the boat. No longer am I on the ramp. I am walking inside of the boat. In Matthew chapter 16, 24 through 26, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do it benefit you if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? If you try to hold on to your life, you will lose it. Man, by the grace of the God, he sent people into my life to teach me that principle in verse 25. And now looking back, that verse is so evident and powerful to me that I can't hold on to it. I will have nothing if I do. But if I turn over my plan for my life, it will be saved and I'll have the best possible outcome for success. I've consciously allowed God to navigate the course of my life. Oh, there's days I want to jump off the boat. Just going to be honest and start debating with God. I want to go a different direction, but I just sacrifice my will back on the altar and let him steer again. It isn't easy. It's a choice. And in my career, he led me to St. Louis about seven years ago to be the AYC director. Never in a million years was that an option or in my plan. I've been to 28 countries and over on, over 24 missions trips. And what a blessing his plans have been for me. And I can't tell you how fulfilling it was to see young people connect with God on a foreign field. There's nothing like it. And it brings me to tears every time. 
Then in 2021, God asked me to give that up. He said this, it was time for a different season for your next season. And my season had been prophesied over me. I just wasn't willing to allow it to happen just yet. I wasn't ready. I was comfortable. I was where I thought I needed to be. But he's like, Sunitha, your next season is, it's coming. So I had no indication of what would be next, but I just obeyed. I, told, I get, turned in my resignation and I lived an entire year without knowing what was next. A whole year, almost to the day, a whole year. There were weeks when the unknown consumed me, but I reminded myself, I trust the Lord. I have heard from the Lord, and I will allow him to steer the boat. I had to think about Noah and how he lived this principle out, and it helped me. During that unknown, some amazing things happened when I let him steer the boat. I met Jared, my husband, on a mission field, on the mission field. Surely didn't see that one coming, but I let the God steer the boat. Shortly after that, I got a call from uh, Pastor Bland for the opportunity to be the administrative pastor at this amazing and blessed church. Of all the things I promised, this wasn't on my list. I thought I was moving to New York, going to live my best life with all the New York slices and bagels I could eat. Those things are amazing. Again, I had to lay my will on the altar, pick his up, and let him steer the boat. And it's been a huge blessing being able to be here with you guys. He is so faithful and his plans are always better than mine. Always better. He has proven it over and over again. Yes, you have to give up things to get into the boat, but what if instead you looked at what, instead of looking at what you're leaving behind, what are you gaining? What if we look at it like that? A life full of purpose and protection, that's what my God gives. And a life of salvation. God has shown me where some of you are at. Some of you are on the ramp that leads to the boat's door, looking around at all the things that you'll have to give up and distracted by all the plans and expectations you have for your life. I can't point those things out that you're staring at unwilling to let go of, but you know what those things are. And the Lord is showing you what those things are. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 through 39, it says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets, parties, and weddings right up into the time Noah entered his boat. The people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them away. And this is the way that it will be when the Son of Man comes. I often wondered what happened to the people during Noah's time. And this scripture just kind of shows us that they were distracted with things of their own nature and plans. The scripture says that they were caught up in the things of the world, distracted and missed it. There's nothing really wrong with celebrations and all of that. God tells us that we should celebrate. We should be joyous and hang out with each other and love that, but don't let those things consume you where you miss what God is saying. God has sent you a preacher week after week revealing those things that are distracting you. You are afraid to give them up and let go of control, or maybe you're afraid of what people will say. So you stand on the ramp not fully in the boat because you aren't willing to surrender your will for his. I've watched pastors stand right here for the last year and preach his heart out to help you get in the boat. He has dug out all the muck and uncovered the enemy's confusion, distraction, and cunning ways that he is doing to be able to manipulate you, to be able to put something over your eyes so that you don't see it, to be able to plug up your ears so that you don't hear it. But he sent a man of God to show you and uncover those things. Pastor Blaine has uncovered the rebellion and the witchcraft that has tried to make its stake in our families. He's shown light into dark and evil places and called out the spirit of intimidation that repeatedly tries to plant itself among us permanently. 
He prays for each of you daily and calls the name of Jesus over this church. He wants us in the boat. He wants us to live a life of following Christ, not after our own flesh, which is corrupt and carnal. Pastor has spent time preaching righteousness to help us get in the boat. He's exposed all the evil, even the things we weren't aware of. That's who he is. He's looking out for our souls. If you haven't been willing to get into the boat because you can't control where the boat is going, Noah couldn't either. He just had to trust God would guide him and his family where they needed to go. Yes, I know once you're in the boat, there isn't any steering mechanisms, no sails. You release complete control and you have to trust God. But God ensures the vessel's safety and direction. God guides you and you just trust him. At the end of Noah's story, we see how God guided the boat safely for days and Noah and his entire family ended up exactly where he needed to be. The earth was washed away and everyone who chose not to get into the boat was written out of the rest of the story. And in 2 Peter 3, 6 through 7 and 9, it says, then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Just like God gave Noah a chance to get in the boat, he's inviting you to get into the boat today too. He isn't really being slow about his promise to return and destroy the earth. He's being patient for your sake, extending grace and mercy to each of us so that we can get into the boat. So I pray that you hear my heart today. I'm not up here spewing judgment or inserting any type of emotional manipulation. Please don't take my words with an edge or a twist. But my heart is aching because some of you are about to make a decision to get off the ramp and not get in the boat. God sees where you're at and knows your thoughts and I'm pulling for you today. God asked me to pull for you to come to this altar to choose to get into the boat that he's provided for you. He's waiting for you to get into the boat. I know it may sound crazy right now and the chaos and the consuming, all of the craziness that's happening and the consuming thoughts of the future are bleak, but get into the boat and trust him. I know you want to control the situation because you think you know what's best, but I promise God's plans are a lot higher and better than ours and you need to trust him. The boat will take you exactly where you're needed, land you in the place where God intended and will keep you through it all. Put yourself back in Noah's day. The rain started to fall and the door to the ark is shut. What would you have given up to get on the boat? Think of the distracted people who missed out and think about what they would have gained if they would have been paying attention. Now think of yourself today. What's holding you back from getting on the boat? Is it worth it? What is holding you back from saying yes to salvation? Let's stand. These altars are open. And I invite you, if you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost and you want to choose salvation today, you can choose it. You can get filled with the Holy Ghost and you can be baptized in Jesus' name. Today is your day of salvation. Come and get into the boat. If you're trying to navigate the course of your own life today, I invite you to this altar and let a loving and merciful God guide you and choose to get into the boat. If you've tried it your way and it's not working, choose his way, trust him, 
have faith and come to this altar and put your will on it and die out and let it go and tell God, I'm laying my will down and I'm picking yours back up, Lord. I'm getting in the boat. Yes, you have to give up some things, but instead of looking at what you're giving up or leaving behind, look at what you're gaining, an eternity in heaven and a life guided by my king, by your king, the one who died on the cross for you. The boat has been built by a loving and merciful God, and he's inviting you to say yes to it. So won't you come? Won't you come to this altar, put your will on it, and die out, and let the Lord speak to you? On behalf of the Sanctuary family, we want to thank you for joining us for this service today. I hope that you are moved in the same way that I am right now by the message that Pastor Sanitha just preached. What a reminder today that God has provided a means of salvation, that God has provided the way through the death, burial, and resurrection for us to be a part of the family, to get in the boat. But the boat is only good if we're willing to take the steps to get into it. Today, maybe the prayer that you need to pray is, God, I, I need salvation. I need to experience that. I've never repented of my sins, been baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of those sins, for the payment of those sins, the forgiveness of those sins. I've never received the Holy Ghost. If that's you, you can have that experience. You can receive the Holy Ghost wherever you are right now. I believe that in the name of Jesus. For some others, maybe the prayer that needs to be prayed today is, God, I I may have received the Holy Ghost, I may have been baptized, but Lord, I'm struggling to give you my will. That maybe there's some things that God is reaching for. There's some things that God has been prompting you to give up. There's some choices that he's been prompting you to make that you've been hesitant to make because it means taking your hands off the steering wheel and saying, God, I trust you. Whichever side you may be on today, I want to invite you to pray with me here for just a moment. Wherever you are, would you pray, God, we thank you for the powerful word that we have just heard. God, I thank you for the promise and hope that we have that you have provided a way, that you've given us an opportunity to get in the boat, to become a part of the family. Lord, I don't know who is watching this right now, but you do. You know exactly where they are. You know what they need. Lord, I know that there may be those that, God, they've been wrestling with whether or not to give their will fully over to you. I pray today would be a day of decision. Today would be the day of salvation, that today they would make up their mind that I'm not going to have one foot in and one foot out anymore, but today I make up my mind that I'm going to submit my will and surrender my plans to you. God, I'm going to pursue after you with everything that I have. For those, Lord, who may have never experienced the life-changing message of the gospel, Lord, the death, burial, and resurrection, who need to experience what that means for us, God, I pray that as they repent of their sins, Lord, that the Holy Ghost would begin to fill their life, that you would begin to make them new, that there would be a new birth that would happen to bring them to new life, God. Those who are praying about baptism, I pray that you would prompt them and nudge them, Lord, to make a decision to be baptized in your name. Believe, Lord, that you are speaking, you are working, you are moving, that you have sent Pastor Sanitha here today to challenge and to quicken us today. Pray that we would, not be, we would not be quick to just dismiss this word, but our hearts would be sensitive. Our hearts would be warm towards you and the message that you have given. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
the name of Jesus. If you're watching this today, you don't have a home church. Maybe you're kind of trying this out online to see what the sanctuary is all about. I want you to know we've saved you a seat. We would love nothing more than to see you next Sunday. In fact, we'd love to see you Wednesday. Come and join us Wednesday at 7 or Sunday morning. We have Sunday school for all ages at 10 a.m. And we have our worship service at 11 o'clock each week. We'd love to have you join us in person sometime soon. But this week, we pray God blesses you, God keeps you, and we hope that you'll join us soon in person. God bless you this week and all that you do.